God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear and terror of you will be in every living creature on the earth, every bird of the sky, every creature that crawls on the ground, and all the fish of the sea. They are placed under your authority. Every creature that lives and moves will be food for you. As I gave the green plants, I have given you everything. However, you must not eat meat with its lifeblood in it. I will require a penalty for your lifeblood. I will require it from any animal and from any human. If someone murders a fellow human, I will require that person's life. Whoever sheds human blood by human, his blood will be shed. For God made humans in his image. But you, be fruitful and multiply. Spread out over the earth and multiply on it. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, Understand that I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, birds, livestock, and all wildlife of the earth that are with you, all the animals of the earth that came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again will you, every creature be wiped out by floodwaters. There will never again be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all future generations. I have placed my bow in the clouds and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I form a cloud, whenever I form clouds over the earth and the bow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all the living creatures. Water will never again become a flood to destroy every creature. The bow will be in the clouds and I will look at it and remember the permanent covenant between God and all the living creatures on earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and every creature on earth. This is the word of the Lord. I wanted to just pray for Sam and Tracy. Uh, They had their third third child and uh, his name is Eliphalet. That's one of King David's sons. And in case that name sounds a bit interesting, it's Hebrew, and it means delivered by God. So I want to pray that that would be so. Lord, we thank you for the gift of new life for the Fergusons, and uh, we pray that little Eliphalet will indeed come to know you, that he will find you as the deliverer of his sins. Lord, I I pray that he would flourish and you would bless Sam and Tracy and they would be helped and served by the body of Christ. I also pray, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see your grace and that some would be delivered this morning from sins that they've been trapped in or even from sin itself and enter your kingdom to find forgiveness. So open our eyes to see your glory and grace, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm, I'm wondering if you've ever really felt the pressure, like everything is depending on you. Uh, at work, the whole team's entire project you've been working towards for months falls on you as the sales presenter to win the contract, or your sports team. Uh, there's two seconds left in the game, and the soccer penalty shot is on you, or the netball or basketball free throw shot is up to you. You sink it, you win, you miss, you lose. Or maybe at home, it's a massive family reunion hosted at your house. So you're not only doing all the decorations, but since you've just finished your pr- apprenticeship as a chef, you want to do all the catering. You know, as I was describing these things where we feel like the pressure's on us, you likely thought of other scenarios and likely less trivial scenarios than losing a sports game. (laughs) Maybe more serious situations like keeping a relationship together, uh, keeping someone from packing in the faith, keeping a, a hospital patient or fellow soldier alive, keeping someone from taking their life. You know, it feels like it's all depending on you. And as we consider the great flood in Genesis 6 through 9, almost nobody has felt this sort of pressure like Noah. The future of the human race riding in his hands in the ark, 
Will the ark be built in time? Will it hold up amidst the storm? Holding itself, holding humanity itself in his hands is how Noah felt. But no one's meant to feel that way except God. You see, we are to live with godly responsibility, accountability, uh, almost um, pursuing excellence in everything we do. But God is in control, not us. The number of days that we have are numbered by God, not us. Nations ultimately rise and fall because of God, not us. And God keeps His covenant promise because of Himself, not us. Bit of a wordy main idea today, but it's this, as God's image bearers, we must strive to honor God's ways, but we really, really need to hope in God, not us. We're going to see that as we consider the flood, and even the design of the ark makes it clear that God is in complete control of our salvation. Think about it. The ark has no rudder, and it has no sail. It was not designed to be navigated or steered at all. The fate of those aboard was left completely in the hands of God. The outline we're going to see as we think about hoping only in the Lord to save is God remembered Noah, Noah remembered God, and then a covenant, and then a caution because we tend to forget God. So look, after a couple of months on other topics like TULIP, we're returning to our Genesis series, and uh, the, the theme of the, the whole book is God's relentless saving grace to the sinful human race. And I think because it's been a couple of months, a, a very brief review of part one, we, we cracked open a little look at the flood before Christmas, and we focused mainly on chapter six. So for review, let's take one step back to chapters four and five recalling that Adam and Eve, or from Adam and Eve, came two family lines of descendants, two families. There was the line of Cain, and uh, he was a jealous murderer of Abel, his brother, with vengeful, polygamous descendants like Lamech. And then the line of Seth was in contrast, a family who called on the name of the Lord, people who trusted in and followed the Lord. But then that was chapter 4 and 5, those two family lines. But by chapter 6, the family lines had completely blurred. There was intermarriage, and the sinful influence of Cain dominated. Humanity was not filling the world with the glory of God, but with severe violence, corruption, and idolatry. And so God's flood was an event displaying both the kindness and the severity of God. And in part one of the flood, we saw that God's kindness and His severity and that His wrath is real, judging all wickedness, but His faithfulness is foolproof, offering grace to all. And throughout Genesis, this pattern continues where judgment is well-deserved, but God shows grace amidst the judgment. And in this case, astonishing grace is shown to Noah and his family. You see, we saw in chapter 6 that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. You see, Noah was just about the only one left on the planet who walked with God. So Noah, uh, sorry, so through Noah, God chose a new family line to replace the blurred one. These are the family records of Noah and we'll see what God does through him. We ended part one with just a sneak peek into chapter eight, and that is where we now turn and spend some time. God remembered Noah. Uh, what we see is that in God remembering Noah, as we consider the flood itself, the flood judgment effectively is an undoing or a reversal of creation, uh, taking breath rather than giving it, uh, unseparating the waters that once separated and gave the sky and the land. 
And Genesis 7.22 sets up chapter 8 with this summary. Everything on dry land died. Everything on dry land died. Then God changes everything because He remembers Noah. Now, it's not that God had forgotten. What that means is God is acting, taking action on a promise that He had made to Noah, a promise back in chapter 6, verse 18, a covenant where God said, I will establish my covenant with you and your family. You will all enter the ark. And that remembering and acting on that promise now to save and preserve Noah is what changes everything. It is literally the hinge on which the whole flood narrative turns. Uh, we, we see in the very center, God remembered Noah, and everything swings. What is done is undone in a mirrored like tit-for-tat um, along the same sequence to the slightest details of the ark closing, the door of the ark closing, the door of the ark opening, everything in sequence reversed. Even the, the weather forecasting or the meteorological turning point is seen in chapter 8, verse 1. See, all this meticulous detail tells us that God is in complete control of saving Noah's family. What a comfort, brothers and sisters. We can trust Him in the big things and the little meticulous details of our life. So, in God's grace to Noah, we see the flood transition in chapter 8, verse 1, from creation reversal to creation renewal. Now, Moses, the the human author of Genesis, wants us to see this Uh, So, he makes very clear parallels with Genesis, the days in Genesis chapter 1, and tracking the sequence in chapter 8. So, God's wind over the waters on day 1 are met with the start of chapter 8, where we see the wind and the waters take away, the, the wind recede the waters. And then in day two, where God separated everything and there was discernible sky, well, likewise in Genesis 8, the rain stopped and the sky, the the waters again separated and there was sky. And then in days three and four and five, there is dry land appearing, there is vegetation coming up, and there's birds are called to fill the air. And what do we see? in Genesis 8 next in sequence. We see the mountaintops become visible. We see likewise that Noah sends out a raven, then a dove, and then the dove brings back vegetation. And finally, things come together on day six where land animals and humanity walk the earth, and the sequence of Genesis 8 ends with Noah and the family and all the animals of the ark once again walking on earth, terra firma, glory. You see, very deliberately what God and Moses want us to see is that Adam, uh, sorry, Noah is Adam 2.0. He is a new man forming a new humanity and a new creation. In fact, just as three sons of Adam were specifically highlighted, so three sons of Noah are specifically highlighted. God is giving us humanity 2.0, a fresh start, a new chance at life after our wholehearted rebellion. This is undeserved and amazing grace. And in verses 15 to 20, God instructs, Noah and the family to head out, and yes, indeed, God remembered Noah. And thankfully, at least at first, Noah remembered God. See, in your Bibles, look at uh, verse 20 of chapter 8. Then Noah built an an altar to the Lord. He took some of 
every kind of clean animal and every kind of clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now, see, there is only one pair of unclean animals that were brought on the ark, but seven pairs of clean animals in anticipation of these very offerings. One of every kind. Grand deliverance calls for grand sacrifice. Listen, men, rather than just getting off the ark and getting straight to work of resuming life and building houses, Noah builds an altar. He starts with worship. Noah restarts humanity with right priorities, with the right reference point to the praise of His glorious grace. Once again, the glory of the Lord is filling the earth, and God is well pleased. Look, look at God's response in verses 21 to 22. When the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, He said to Himself, I will never again curse the ground because of human beings, even though the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth onward. I will never again strike down every living thing as I've done, as long as the earth endures, seed time, harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, day and night will not cease. See, notice that after the fall, we are still inclined to evil. We are still depraved like before the flood. Nonetheless, God will not repeat His global flood judgment because God's righteous justice is satisfied with a pure sacrifice. See, in, in God's holy heavenly courtroom of eternal reckoning, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. This is because life is in the blood, and the wages of sin is death. So, life is required for life, for eternal forgiveness. You see, we call this penal substitutionary atonement. Penal, our penalty, is taken by a substitute so that we can be reconciled with God at one mint, atonement. But the Bible also tells us that the blood of animals cannot take away human sin. Animal substitutionary sacrifices are just shadows pointing us to Jesus Christ, the substance, God in flesh, God taking on humanity so that a sinless man can take the sacrifice of sinful people. And as the pure sacrifice Noah offered was pleasing to the Lord, our Heavenly Father says of Jesus, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. You see, the Father is perfectly pleased only with His sinless Son and His sacrifice on the cross for us, for all who believe. Grand deliverance requires grand sacrifice, and there is no grander sacrifice than God Himself offering Him willingly for us, for our salvation. You see, God must be well pleased by righteous sacrifice to offset God's being deeply grieved at our sin at the painful reckoning that our sin will require, not just in the flood, but ultimately in Christ. You see, God would take the pain and grief upon Himself. Jesus, who would be called the man of sorrows, prophesied by Isaiah, Jesus would say on the night of His betrayal, I am deeply grieved to the point of death as he contemplated the agony of the cross, not just the physical torture, much worse, the agony of taking on the condemnation of sin that we deserve as the wrath of the Father is poured out on the Son in our place. 
the only person in history that felt more pressure than Noah on the ark is Jesus. That's because Jesus not only felt the pressure, the weight of the world was actually on His shoulders, weighed in His nail-pierced hands and feet. And despite the agony to come, Jesus prayed that night, Father, for this hour I have come. It was no accident. It is divine plan that Jesus would give His life for scum like me, scum like us. You see, this is the glory of the gospel, friends. Not only does God grieve Himself for our good, God sacrifices Himself for our good. How can this ever get old? How can, we be, how can we fail to be motivated by this astounding love? It boggles the mind. It troubles my soul that I forget. Look, at least after his mountaintop experience, and it was a literal mountaintop experience because the ark landed on the top of Mount Ararat, at least Noah responded rightly initially. Noah remembered God and began his new life with worship. Will you? Will you begin a new life with Jesus by trusting Him as your Savior, your Lord? And then each and every day, we are to begin with worship by remembering what the Lord has done for us. It's not rocket science. This is the Christian life. You know, Jesus knows we are so prone to forget God's faithfulness to us. He, he, he tells His disciples, He says, don't you understand yet? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets of leftovers you collected? You're stressing about food. Have I not provided? Remember my faithfulness. Our struggle to remember is a theme that just continues through the Gospels, right to the end of the Gospels, when they go to the empty tomb and the angels say, Jesus is not here, He's risen. Remember what He said to you? The Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinners, be crucified and rise on the third day. And then they remembered. You're stressing about your future? Remember His Word, His promise kept, fulfilled. Our response to God's powerful saving grace is to be like Noah's initial response. Grateful sacrifice, grand sacrifice, except you see, with Jesus, ending animal sacrifice with His once-for-all-time perfect sacrifice, our response today, our sacrifice is a bit different. We are to be a living sacrifice, you see? Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, remember chapters 1 to 11, all of this gospel glory. In view of these mercies, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. And as God found Noah's sacrifice to be a pleasant aroma, the Apostle Paul uses similar language for the Christian life. Listen to what he says, through us, God spreads the aroma of the knowledge of Christ in every place, for to God we are the fragrance of Christ. And he goes on to say, and so we are to people who hear the gospel. We often speak about sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus, but rarely do we speak of smelling like the gospel, and yet so we are too to smell like Christ, 
to give off the aroma of Christ as we follow Him and speak of His astounding saving sacrifice. So we could summarize these first two points, that God remembered Noah and Noah remembers God with that phrase at the bottom. Because God remembers us, we are meant to remember Him always, daily. By the way, this is hardly the last time in Genesis that God remembers someone in a time of great need. In Genesis 19, God remembered Abraham, who was praying, and God rescued Abraham's nephew Lot from out of Sodom. In Genesis 30, God remembered Rachel, uh, Isaac's childless wife, who becomes pregnant by God's doing. Later in the book of Exodus, chapter 2, when Israelites become slaves in Egypt, God remembers His covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and delivers Israel. And, and Psalm 9 says, God remembers the cry of the afflicted. Brothers and sisters, whatever your affliction, God is aware and God cares. He's so aware and so full of care, He proved it. You see, He took on flesh to sympathize with us in our weakness and trials, and He took on flesh to save us since He is without sin. So as with Noah, God is accomplishing a work in you and through you. Even when it's difficult, you can trust God, so remember Him and keep your hope in Him. And now we move to the covenant where we see God blessing and protecting His image bearers. Look at verse 9, uh, chapter 9, verse 1. I want you to listen for an echo. See what you hear echoing from earlier in Genesis. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Anything come to mind? Genesis chapter 1, where the blessing and the mandate to be fruitful and multiply, again, Moses the author is drawing a correlation between humanity 1.0 and Adam and humanity 2.0 with Noah and a renewal of creation. See, the following verses unpack the next steps for Noah's family, including some new steps as the world is repopulated. Things a bit new and different from chapter 1. Look at verses 2 to 4 in your Bible. The fear and the terror of every living creature on earth, every bird in the sky, every creature on the ground, and all the fish of the sea will dread you. They are placed under your authority. Every creature that moves and lives will be food for you. As I have uh, gave the green plants, now I give you everything. However, you must not eat meat with its lifeblood still in it. Now, there's heaps of fascinating details in Genesis chapter 9, but we need to focus on the main plot line that's developing in the book of Genesis. So, no, I'm not going to recommend a book called The Genesis Diet because the text really is not at all suggesting that a vegan diet is healthier than a meat diet because now average lifespans suddenly decrease. That's not the point. The point is that humans are created as in God's image. We are God, the stewards of God's planet. We are called to fill it and subdue it and rule over it, including the animals. And we're called to get on with the task. But what we note here, the difference is that unlike Adam and Eve who had this very task given to them, that task was given in a flawless and deathless world. Noah's family is given the task in a fallen and death-filled world. You see, waters have exploded from the depths. Tectonic plate shifts have occurred. Mountains have surged. Massive erosion from receding floodwaters and not only has the physical ecosystem changed, the relational ecosystem has changed. See, as Noah's family in the ark 
repopulate the world, animals will now do so with the dread of man, which, by the way, will encourage animals to disperse and fill the earth. But also, animals are now fair game for our food. People are now permitted to include animals in their diet, but we assume the violent pre-flood God-forsakers were already doing so, just without God's permission. But then what verse 4 adds beyond this is respect for animal life. You see, humans are not to devour animals the way animals devour animals or the way pagans devour animals. Well, its lifeblood is pulsing in its flesh. God says in verse 4, such a disregard for the gift of life is an offense to the giver of life. See, this prohibition paves the way for animal sacrifice in the Mosaic law. Without a respect for life in the blood, well, there is no appreciation of sacrifice of blood. So, while animal blood may be shed but not consumed, human blood must not be shed, according to verse 5, which brings respect for human life. See, no sin shows greater contempt for the Creator and for humans than murder. Slaying someone created in the image of God, God guards His glory and His image bearers. If a human is killed by an animal, it must be executed. And if a human is killed deliberately murdered by another human, the murderer is to be executed. Verse 6, whoever sheds human blood by humans, his blood will be shed. For God made humans in His image. Notice that the main reason for capital punishment or the death penalty is not to be a deterrent. So, statistics or questions about how effective capital punishment is as a deterrent to lower homicide rates, well, they're not really relevant. The issue is the sacredness of human life created in God's image. May the Lord have mercy on our society with a bloodlust for abortion and other kinds of murder. You see, as humanity 2.0 sets out, God is reminding Noah the violent homicide which characterized society before the flood is no longer to be tolerated. Governments and nations that will form from Noah's children are to ensure this. Yes, government systems of justice are fallible and corrupt, but remember God gave this mandate to a fallen, flawed world. So, the right legal approach is to be as unbiased as possible with as many safeguards as possible, not to ignore God's mandate. It is given to all humanity before the law of Moses, and so it is not outdated or made obsolete by the new covenant. Verses 1 to 7 are very clear that God protects the sacredness of His image bearers. He wants a new glorifying humanity, and He blesses His image bearers and all creatures in the new creation to be filled and multiply. Now, to give us hope and confidence, God forms a covenant in verses 8 and following to press on with this task. A covenant is a binding promise between parties, and God always validates or verifies His covenants with signs. And with Noah, God's sign is rather fittingly a rainbow accompanying the clouds. This is a picture of a double rainbow taken on my, I took on my street a, a few days ago. Now, conservative Bible scholars debate 
if the flood was the first time rain occurred on the earth, and therefore the first time rainbows occurred, or if rain and rainbows were already existing and God simply attached new significance to a rainbow. Sort of like he did with circumcision, a practice that already existed in some parts of the world, but God attached significance to circumcision as the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Either way, the sign is a promise. Look in your Bibles. Well, let's read verses 12 to 15. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature, a covenant for all future generations. I have placed my bow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and earth. Whenever I form clouds over the earth and the bow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between you and me and all living creatures, and water will never again become a flood to destroy every creature. Take that, Kevin Costner and Waterworld, right? As far as media goes, Linus from the Peanuts comic has much better theology and much better counsel for Lucy. So much rain. What if the whole world floods? And uh, Linus says, no way, Jose. God promised in Genesis 9 the world would never flood again, and the sign of the promise is the rainbow. And Lucy says, oh, you've taken a great load off my mind. And Linus says, sound theology has a way of doing that. Great stuff. Amen, Linus. So the covenant and the sign of the promise are meant to remind us to put our hope in the Lord and certainly not ourselves. Here's why we need to put our hope in the Lord and His promise and His sign. Because we tend to forget the Lord and His promise, and that is what, exactly what Noah does and his children. This is a, a provocative, intriguing, and perplexing last section, and it bridges, uh, if you will, prepping us for the nations that are going to come in chapter 10, but it reminds us that our hope is not in Noah. Uh, A couple of years likely have transpired since the flood. Uh, Vineyards have grown. Look in your Bible at verses 18 to 23. Noah's sons who came out of the ark were Shem, Hamath, and Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. So they've had a son now. These were the three, Noah's three sons, and from them the whole earth was populated. See, there's the bridge to chapter 10, but now back to Noah was a man of the soil. He began by planting a vineyard. He drank some of the wine and became drunk and exposed or uncovered himself in his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. And then Shem and Japheth took a cloak, placed it over both their shoulders. Walking backwards, they covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness." this sounds reasonably simple, but given the radical response, many think there's a bit more at play here. Look at the response in verses 24 to 27. When Noah awoke from his, what we could say hangover, but it says drinking, and learned what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Canaan is cursed. He will be the lowest of slaves to his brothers. He also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Let Canaan be Shem's slave. Let God extend to Japheth and bless Japheth. Let Japheth dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be Shem's slave. No doubt you see what I mean by radical response. Now, for starters, I want to just say a couple of things. Noah, not God in this case, curses Canaan, Ham's offspring, because this is a curse about descendants, like the curse of Adam and Eve on their descendants. So, this is from Noah. It's not like God is like, yeah, slavery. As well, a curse to create, a a, a curse does not create a mandate. Okay, I don't know anybody who cultivates thorns and thistles just so 
God's curse on the ground will remain today. So, this is Noah's doing. It's not God's, but yet blessings and cursings by patriarchs, while, while not prophetic, were, were taken very seriously. We'll, we'll see later in Genesis 27, Esau weeps because Isaac, his father, did not have another blessing. He gave the blessing to Jacob. He did not have another blessing for Esau. And similarly, Isaac declared that Jacob would be the master of Esau, very parallel. So, here regarding the story of Noah's sinful drunkenness and Ham's sinful indecency, we're provided only the bare essentials, pardon the pun. Is there something more going on? The really quick clue that possibly is this. In Hebrew, the phrase, his father's nakedness, that also occurs in Leviticus 18.7, and it says this, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, that is the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. Or as the CSB puts it more politely, do not violate the intimacy between your father and mother, for she is your mother. So, so taking that meaning of the phrase, father's nakedness, not simply himself, but that marital intimacy and exposure of it, then factoring the concept of recurrence, that, that a similar theme recurs later in the book of Genesis as we consider thinking ahead to Genesis 19, where Abraham's nephew Lot and his daughters, Lot's daughters are spared catastrophic judgment from Sodom while fire and brimstone are raining down on the city and they're hiding in a cave. See, as the, the family of Noah here is left alone in the world, Lot's daughters think with fire raining down from heaven, they too will be left alone in the world. And hiding in that cave, Lot's daughters say to each other, let's make our father drunk with much wine and we will lie with him that we may preserve offspring. See, that has led some scholars to suggest that just as Reuben, the son of Jacob, lost his firstborn status for lying with his father's concubine, Genesis 35, and as Absalom, the son of David, attempted to take his father's throne by lying with his father's concubine, Genesis, uh, that's 2 Samuel 16, that possibly Ham either did similarly with his own mother in a power play to overtake Noah's authority, or Ham suggested the idea to his brothers, Shem and Japheth. It's not, not clear, not, not conclusive, but that's a possibility to this, this radical reaction. The Canaanites, descendants of Ham, would become a great source of temptation of the people of God, and their perversions were flagged to Israel as behaviors to avoid especially their religious drunken orgies. So whatever happened, Ham is, has greatly dishonored his father and mother, and Shem and Japheth strongly disagreed, and they honored them and covered them. So as why is this here? Why is this story here? This is what's clear in the narrative as the flood narrative finishes off. Noah, we've seen, is presented as Adam 2.0 in a renewed creation, mirroring Genesis 1. Well, now Noah and his family are just as clearly presented as the fall 2.0, from creation 2.0 to the fall 2.0, as the sequence of events mirrors Adam's fall. You see, God blesses Adam and family, and God plants a garden. God bless Noah, and Noah plants a vineyard. Eve and then Adam ate some of its fruit, and now Noah drinks some of its wine. Their eyes are opened, and they realize they're naked. Well, Noah gets drunk and his nakedness is exposed. Uh, they made clothing to cover themselves, and here the sons, the good sons, took clothing to cover their parents' nakedness. 
The sons of Adam formed two family lines, Cain and Seth, and the sons of Noah formed two family lines, Canaan and Shem. Cain is cursed, Seth is blessed. Canaan is cursed, Shem is blessed. It is the fall all over again. Noah and sons have blown it big time. Adam was not up to the task, and Seth's line mostly blurred with Cain's. Noah was not up to the task, and Shem's line largely blurs with Canaan's as you go through the history of Israel. We keep blowing it. Our hope is not in ourselves, but in the Lord. And our hope is in the promised offspring of Eve, of Seth of Shem, of Abraham, and that is Jesus. All peoples and nations will be blessed through Him. People from every tongue, tribe, and nation. So there's still hope for Canaanites who trust in Christ. There's hope for Canaanites. There's hope for Demorites. There's hope for Bookerites and Limites and Beckerites and you. Noah's name means rest. Though Noah fell in sin, Jesus did not. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke, His leadership, His lordship, and learn from me, Jesus says. He's lowly and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your soul. If you are not yet a Christian this morning, I hope you would bow your knee and trust in the only one who is worth our trust, Christ. And don't delay, because this is what Jesus said reflecting back on the days of Noah. As the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark. They did not know until the flood came and swept them all away, and this is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. Today is the day of salvation. Thankfully, God's darkest warnings are always accompanied by His way of escape. The ark is alongside the flood, and Jesus is our ark, delivering us from death and judgment by wood of a cross. Trust in Him today. If you are a Christian, hear this. Atop Mount Ararat, Noah had his literal mountaintop experience, but you know what? He became forgetful. We see what happened in the fall 2.0. You cannot bank on a mountaintop experience and think, that's enough, right? I did my church camp my youth camp. Oh, it was a great Sunday service. Whatever. We can't bank on something in the past. We must regularly remember lest we forget. We consider Romans 12 verse 1 earlier. Offering ourselves to God is a living sacrifice. And Romans 12 verse 2 speaks of what we need to keep on doing. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern again and again what is the good and pleasing and perfect will of God. Continually renewing our mind in the mercies of God, or we will forget. So I want to close with an illustration of mindset encouragement from a similar sort of rescue that Noah had, a burial though not of water, but of earth. In the year 2010 in Chile, 33 miners were trapped for 69 days. It's the the mining survival world record. Rescuers went through astounding efforts just to sustain them alive for for 69 days. They, They drilled a pilot hole down to send water and food for those 69 days. Then they slowly bored out a bigger hole to fit a person through, and one by one, the miners came up from the belly of the earth. Took an entire day to get them out, dawn to dusk. 
those miners really realized they were powerless to save themselves. Powerless. And you know what? When they came out, they didn't point to themselves. <laughs> Look at how awesome I am, and I survived 69 days. They came out thankful for their rescuers, hugging and praising those who rescued them. See, while the Chilean miners were still trapped with company permission, something besides food and water was sent down the pipe during those days of hoping and waiting. And it was an audio version of the Jesus movie, Luke, the, the Gospel of Luke dramatized, and it was provided by the Chilean director of Student Life Ministries. See, these miners, unmistakably aware of their physical worldly predicament, heard the gospel and became unmistakably aware of their spiritual predicament, but also of the rest and peace and hope offered in Jesus. A few days later, one of the miners named Jose, uh, Jose Enriquez, he sent up a letter in the tube, thank you for this tremendous blessing for me and my coworkers. I am fine because Christ lives, and Christ now lives in me. And at the end of the letter, he signed off Psalm 95, verse 4, in his hands are the depths of the earth. Many expressed repentant faith in Christ for his glorious priceless forgiveness, and for those who trusted in Christ, Enriquez requested special t-shirts be made and sent down in hope and in faith that they would survive and be rescued in the earthly sense. They came up wearing t-shirts that said, Gracias, Señor. Thank you, Lord. See, they came up full of praise, singing not just of their rescue, but of the glory of their rescuer. It's personal. And I tell you what, this morning, I reckon if those miners woke up in full view of their rescue all of those years ago, they would have as much jubilation and thankfulness as the day they were rescued. Lest we forget, so it should be with us, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your worship. Let's pray as the musicians come up. Oh, Father, how we need a fresh eye on our sins forgiven and a fresh view of our Savior taking them. Thank you that your darkest warnings are accompanied with the way of escape in Christ. Lord, we as your church help us to not forget, but to remember as you never forget us in your covenant love. Lord, even we as church members, as your children can cause you grief. And so your word says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not give the, the devil a foothold, an opportunity. Lord, help us not to be the fall 3.0, but help us to be mature and Christ-like, as we remember your glorious covenant promise, and that our hope is in you and you alone. So, in your name we praise, in your name we sing, the name of Christ alone. Amen.